Good morning. All right, if you can find your seat, that would be great. I have I didn't several. I need to make you run. I'm sorry. That's okay. We have several announcements, so we're going to get started here. The first announcement always has to do with the theme of the month, right? We take the theme from our Sunday school group. The theme for this month is love. And we're going to show others how much they matter to us by expressing our love uh, through acts of kindness. And we have a memory verse that goes along with our theme every month. So Jessica's going to come forward. I heard that Kendra did some motions last yeah. week. Yay! Yeah. Kendra, thank you for helping out there. Mom, thank you for leading the service. <laughs> but we had fun. So I do, before we go on, I do want to thank my mom for leading the service. I want to thank Barbara and Andre and Tina for leading worship. And I want to thank Kendra for doing her best to come up with motions right on the spot there. Thank you for that. Thank you for Ben for doing the video and the audio and making sure that everything was online so that we could watch it while we were on vacation. And um, according to Mike... Thank you for being quiet while I was preaching on the screen. He now wants me to stand behind a screen every week to talk because he thinks that will make you be quiet. I don't know. I said there's nothing that can shut these guys up. I was amening up there in the front. By oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> All right. Well, Jess, do you want to lead us in some motions with the memory verse? I like that. I liked that. That was good. See? All right. Hey, look at We want to welcome our special guests this morning. Can you guys just stand up really quick so they can see who you are? So I shared with them last week that you guys were the ones that sent me into training school, that I worked for you 30 years ago, and that if they wanted any juice or anything on my, you know, 20s, they could come to you. And I said, don't talk to him. He'll tell you the truth. Talk to her. She's nice. <laughs> so you can talk to her. She'll give you some good stories about me, perhaps. But a little later on, I think right before the message, I'm going to have you guys come up and tell us three things about you that we wouldn't know. So be thinking about that. Each of you, three things we wouldn't know. All right. So uh, do back this Tuesday, I think, is uh, back to school supplies. So we're going to be putting those together this week. Thank you for everybody who's already brought stuff in. John's office looked like uh, Walmart <laughs> earlier this week, so thank you for that. And um, the women are going to work on getting those put together this week. Kendra, do you have you noticed? So if you would like to buy a backpack, like a boy and maybe an older boy backpack, okay? So good morning. Um, this Wednesday is the hymn sing, so 2 o'clock next door, we're going to bring out the old hymn books and we're going to have a good old-fashioned hymn sing, all right? You going to come to that, Chuck? Yeah, I'll do it. All right, good. Uh, this next weekend is family camp, and for the first time, Susan has agreed to lead the service for me, so those of you special ones who are going to be here live and not at family camp, Susan will be leading the service. I'll preach via a, a video message, and Barbara has agreed to lead worship again. So she beat me. I beat she her beat up. Me into submission. I did. I want you to know. I did. My fists are still sore. Oh, good. So <laughs> August twenty third through the twenty sixth is Vacation Bible School. If you are bringing your kids to that, please sign up. There is uh, not a long list over there. I have a few. Um, from the community that are, that are signed up, but if your kids are going to come, sign them up. If you would like to help with Vacation Bible School, please see me. I've only had a few people come forward and say they want to help. So come and see me, and um, I'll get you signed up to help in, in Vacation Bible School. And bring your swimsuit every day, because every day we're going to make a splash, okay? 
And then uh, we have the Fruit Loop coming up. So this is a um, men and women um, combined activity. The men's group and the women's group have joined forces, and we're going to do the Fruit Loop. So we've got eight stops, starting with coffee, <laughs> the middle stop, coffee, and the last stop, coffee. coffee. Okay. So and then we'll hit a fruit, a few fruit fruit farms in between. Okay. But uh, the sign-up sheet is on the back. You can sign up for that. We also have an ice cream social coming up Wednesday, August 31st at 2 o'clock next door. So if you want to come to that, mark your calendar for that. And then I think the last announcement, men's camp at Camp Arnold. They decided they are going to do men's oh, camp. Cool. The sign-up sheet is on the back counter. The dates are September 23rd to the 25th. And if you want to go, then sign up on the sign-up sheet back there. Um, and we'll get you signed up for men's camp. Is that all the announcements, Gavin? It oh, is. Diane. Diane is out of the hospital. She's back. <laughs> Welcome back, Diane. Um, I believe that we uh, had a birthday uh, in the church, didn't we, in the last week or so while we were gone? I thought that somebody had a birthday. Yeah, oh, well, I didn't. Craig had a birthday. How about a sobriety date? Anybody got a sobriety Sandy had a birthday. She did, and we haven't sang to her. Hi, love. Sandy is 60. I know, right? She, yeah, yeah. Two, come on. Anybody else have a birthday, a sobriety day, a celebration of any kind? No? We're going to, oh, yes? I got baptized. If you did get baptized yesterday. Yeah, good. Well, we're going to sing happy birthday to these three people because yesterday you were kind of reborn, right? So, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Yay. Hey, we, uh, we missed you guys last week, but we are very, very happy to be back. It was kind of neat to watch online. Um, <laughs> You guys building that puzzle together, talking about being uh, uh, the body of Christ and how we're all interconnected and how every piece of the puzzle is important, every, every gift in the church is important, and to watch the, you guys come together and build that puzzle last week, oh, it was so emotional. So I love all my little puzzle pieces. Thank you. Um, but we're glad to be back in the house of the Lord today. We're glad to be here to worship with you and to uh, just lift the name of Jesus up, right? Amen? Amen. All right, let's, thank you. Let's worship the Lord and uh, just give him honor and praise this morning. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and he won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place. We shout out your praise. I love you guys. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross. Then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. No! We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. No! We shout out your praise. 
Offering, he deserves it. Amen. <laughs> How many of you have had a miracle happen in your life? Raise your hand. Right? If you're here today, that's a miracle, right? There's so many things that want to prevent you from being here today. I know I've had miracles in my life. There's a line in this song that I really like. It says, um, I want to I want to live like I know who you are. And then the best line, I hope I never get over what you've done. Right? I want to live like I know who you are. I I hope I never get over what you've done in my life. Amen. Amen. God is good. Oh, All the time. That's right. <laughs>
Jesus. Anybody else grateful for the blood of Jesus? Yes. How it washes us and cleanses us. Funny that blood can cleanse us, right? Funny thing. How many of you have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus?
Father, we thank you so much for the blood of Jesus and how it just cleanses us, makes us white as snow. Look how we pray for our children right now that you would just bless them as they go on to Sunday school and have a lesson prepared just for them. Lord, we just ask that you would bless our time together as we open up the word of God. Amen. All right, kids. Jesus loves But anyway, um, we're going to have you guys come up and share three things. And did you discuss to make sure the three things aren't the same? No. no. Okay, that's all right. Um, you go first. That way, if she says something, you got to figure something else out. Okay? So come on up here. Oh, oh, oh. Can we have, yeah, John's bringing you a mic. Mike, who needs a mic? <laughs> he, he's a, a, a drama king, literally went to school for a drama. <laughs> of a performance. Uh, uh, three things you don't know about me. Number one, I'm, I'm a Northwest girl but was never stationed here with the Salvation Army. So I was raised in Pendleton, Oregon. And um, I'm a farm girl. So and if any of you, you know, have a deep appreciation for livestock, I'm right there with you. There you go. I um, learned about uh, business and raising money and a lot of skills that I use now uh, you know, breeding sheep and selling goats and livestock, a little bit of rodeo, but, you know, rodeos are on Sunday and I always felt guilty. <laughs> a little bit of rodeo, but, um, but loved small town life, loved growing up on a farm. Um, I would just came back from a, a retreat actually this week with women officers, and one of the questions they asked you was um, in the idea of self control, you know, that gift of the spirit of self control. Who are people that model that in your life? And I said, you know, I was um, privileged to be raised with grandparents and parents that modeled that, um, especially my dad. You know, you feed the animals before yourself. Chores done and then you play. And there's just a lot of things that still shape me as a person. And uh, rather than, I guess, rebelling against those because my parents didn't come to faith till I was uh, like a senior in high school, um, it just made sense to my heart growing up that way, and um, God used that in me. Uh, another thing about me was read. So, like, Kindle Unlimited was invented for me. And in general, that idea that my whole library is with me, it's literally with me, like, right now. That's, like, the best thing. And the other thing I would say is um, I am a professional passenger. So I do drive, but anymore, I just sort of hate to if I don't have to. And in our role, we, um, our responsibility with the Salvation Army is to oversee the work in Washington and then most of Idaho and Montana. So being out there with people and assisting them or being there with planning is a big part of what we do. So I love driving out. Uh, I love meeting people. I love hearing what people are doing and... Um, how God is changing their lives and how we're taking God's love in action to the community and making an impact upon the community. So it's really exciting. And, you know, with those great cameras and phones, I can take great pictures as we're driving. I can appreciate the scenery because I'm a professional passenger and I have my own driver. So let me introduce you to my driver of 37 years, Tim Foley. Well, I'm not a farm girl. <laughs> so I've got, I got three, three things, right? Yeah. Three things. OK. The first one is choo-choo. The second one is there's something rotten in Denmark. Okay. And the third thing is 310. Right. Any guesses? Choo-choo is like to eat. Choo-choo is I like to eat. <laughs> 
So I'm a model railroad enthusiast, model train. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I actually have a little layout, and I, I kind of follow the uh, Union Pacific Burlington Northern look, you know, like Pendleton, Oregon. So I love, I'm a closet uh, model railroader. I love that. It's kind of a nerdy thing. Um, uh, there's something rotten in Denmark. <laughs> We're never home to have food in the refrigerator, to be honest, because somebody is a professional passenger in this family. By the way, I just want to say, you know, we've been journeying together now 37 years. As married, I met Cindy on a blind date. There's, remember when we used to date yeah. before swiping left or right or whatever other things the kids are doing these days? And, but she rolls the window down and pops my eardrums out every time. Oh, look, we're on the Palouse. It's a wheat farm. Keep the window up. You know, so anyways. There's something rotten in Denmark. I love doing community theater, even still. And uh, I, I, whenever I get a chance, and I, I have a chance uh, coming up to do a little bit thing. So I w uh, there's something rotten in Mar Denmark comes from Hamlet. Marcellus, I, I played uh, Marcellus in San Francisco a few years ago in a little community theater. So I like doing that. I was trained as a professional actor at Berkeley Repertory Theater, and God saved me. My first encounter with the Salvation Army was doing a play called Major Barbara by George Bernard Shaw. Uh, so I, I, whenever I can, I still do that. I, when, when I'm not driving the professional <laughs> passenger someplace. And then the third thing is, I said 310. So three years, 10 months, Cindy and I will end our journey as active Salvation Army officers and we'll be settling somewhere here in Clark County. That's uh, what we're looking at right now. So just pray with me that, that home prices plummet. Yeah, right. <laughs> Something becomes available and who knows, you know. But we've heard great things. Uh, we've, we've had a good journey many years ago. Samantha was our youth worker when we were the Corps officers in Phoenix, uh, at Phoenix Citadel. I had a full head of hair back then. <laughs> <That's what you laughs> <did>. <laughs> Second day Sam worked with us, it just all yeah. fell out. <laughs> but we've heard so many great things, and we appreciate the work that you and John do here and the love that you've given to your people over, the, over time. And we're so proud of you. And we have really, really tried very hard to schedule just coming in on a Sunday. So thank you for, uh, and for all of your love and hospitality and for just keep the mission of the Salvation Army going, which is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the whosoever. And uh, thank you for welcoming us and accepting us. God bless you. All right, thank you for sharing. And uh, it is a joy to be standing here 30 years after starting off my ministry with you guys. Because um, that was really the kickoff for me. And to, that's where I felt the call to become a minister. And you guys taught me so much. Without, you were, I don't, I don't, maybe you were intentional about it, but it didn't seem intentional. It just was natural, right? And I, I learned a lot under you. And I want to thank you for the support that you pledged to me during my two years of training. And, um, I, I needed that, and it was life-saving on multiple occasions. So thank you for that, and I'm just so glad. 30 years later, you're ending your career, right? You started my career with me, and now I'm hoping you'll stay here until you're all done. And then Clark County, you know, I mean, that's pretty cool, right? I mean, it's, God is so, I can't, I know I, it's a cliche, but God is so good, right? right? right. And um, I'm, just, I'm just blessed that you're here today, so. Welcome. We're going to ask God to speak to us through the word of God. We have a little chorus that we like to sing, um, so let's just sing that together right now. Word of God, speak, would you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty, to be still and know that you're in this place please let me stay and rest in your holiness word of god's 
speak. Amen. So since the beginning of the year, um, we've been in the book of Romans. This is my first time in 20-something uh, years, that, uh, 25 years, that I've preached the book of Romans. I don't know why I never preached it before, but now that I'm in it, I've said many times, I'm glad I never preached it before because I wasn't mature enough to preach it before, right? It is a deep, deep uh, book to get into. And that's why we've been in it for six months and we're only in chapter 12. Um, Paul has challenged us in many ways over the last six months about uh, living authentic Christian lives, right? What does that look like? And at the beginning of chapter 12, a few weeks ago, I only did the first two verses. And in those first two verses, we decided that we needed to do a mini-series within a series. Because those two verses in uh, the beginning of chapter 12 um, run all the way through. They, it's a theme all the way through chapter 15. So um, Paul gives us some instructions in those first two verses, and then for the next couple of chapters, he explains that and how that, that's going to happen. So we're going to read these two verses together. We decided they're going to be our theme verses. When I say we decided, you know what I really mean, right? I decided that they would be our theme verses, and so we're going to read them together each week until we are done um, with this mini-series. So let's read them together. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Very good. Very nice. Thank you. Um, I can't get it help but get excited when I read that and the, the further into that passage I go the more excited I get especially when you get to the part where it says don't conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed right since we've been in this series about being transformed I've been thinking about um, talking about the transformers you guys know what the transformers are right yeah. way back in 1984 some of you weren't even born some of you were already really old. <laughs> but way back then, when you were talking about um, inner, you weren't, when you said transformers, you weren't talking about energy transference between circuits, right? You were referring to Hasbro's transformers, the toys and the cartoon. And the cartoon series were about these alien robots who came down to Earth and they could transform themselves and disguise themselves as like cars or fire trucks or even dinosaurs, right? So they were transformed um, in order to disguise themselves. Now, the, the series was um, the Autobots. They were the good guys, right? And they were against who? That's right, Adam, I knew you would know, the Decepticons, right? And they were trying to steal Earth's energy, and so there was this battle that ensued between these sets of robots, the good robots and the bad robots. And each individual robot had a special power. Or, if we're relating it to humans, each of us good Christian humans have a spiritual gift, which we talked about last week, right? And these characteristics or these these special powers made them an, a really important asset to the team, okay? And plus, these individual robots could combine together, these little puzzle pieces could combine together, is it all coming together yet? And they would become super robots. So last week I gave out puzzle pieces and I talked about how we're each individual pieces of the puzzle, God has gifted us differently, and when we come together we build this beautiful image of the church, right? And you guys built a puzzle together last week, I was so blessed to watch that um, while I was on vacation online. 
So as I'm thinking about the Transformers this week and um, drawing parallels from the, the Transformers and, and talking about how it relates to us as Christians, um, I, I think that the, the reference there, clearly, we're not robots, just in case you were wondering, but the Holy Spirit transforms us from our old spiritual ways into new creations, right? Creates us into these beautiful new beings with new natures and new powers to serve God. And part of that transformation we talked about last week is receiving these spiritual gifts from the Holy Spirit. And those gifts are used to serve one another, right? We, we have those giftings not so that we can look cool, right? Not so that we can brag about them. We have those giftings in order to serve the body of Christ. And we discussed how as the body of Christ, we all need to come together. And we also talked about how each and every one of you, I don't care how insignificant you may feel, each and every one of you are a piece of the overall puzzle, right? And your part is important. So if you're not using your spiritual gift within the church, come talk to me. Let's, let's talk about, I'll give you a spiritual gift test. We'll talk about how to use that gift. And we want to get you connected because really, if you're not using your gift, we're missing a piece of the puzzle. The full picture isn't there of what this church is to, to look like. So when we all do our part, the church is beautiful. In chapter 12 of Romans, Paul's speaking of being transformed. And um, it, it's, we, we're not hiding our real identity. This is a real transformation. The thing about the, the transformers is they would switch back and forth, right? We don't switch back and forth. Once we're transformed by God, we allow him to continue to do the work in our lives. And then Paul goes on to tell us how we are to be transformed. And so in the next few chapters, he talks about that. And last week, we talked about being transformed through spiritual gifts, being a part of the body of Christ. Today, we're going to talk about love. So let's look at our scripture passage for today, found in verses 9 to 13. It says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. So I read an interesting story. Um, every once in a while, we'll get this surprise um, gift in the mail, and my father-in-law will order us our daily bread, you know, those little devotional books. And it will show up at our house, and for the whole year, we have these little devotional books. And he doesn't tell us he's doing it. He just does it. It's so nice. I love that. And one of the books, um, they make excellent reading for while you're studying on the toilet, yeah. right? <laughs> I love to read our daily bread in my bathroom, and I read a story in there. It's about this professor of psychology who had no children of his own, but whenever he saw a neighbor scolding their children, um, he would say, you know, you should love the child. You should love them and not punish them. Now, one hot summer day, the professor was repairing his concrete driveway. And he was tired after several hours of hard work, so he laid down his, his trowel and he wiped the perspiration from his forehead and he started to walk towards the house. And just then, out of the corner of his eye, what does he see? A little mischievous kid, right? Putting his foot into the wet cement. And he rushed over and he grabbed the kid and he was just about to spank the kid when the neighbor leaned out his window and said, watch it, professor, don't you remember, you must love the child. And at that point, the professor yelled back, furious, I do love him in the abstract, but not in the concrete, right? <laughs> now, the Apostle Paul was concerned about people who loved in the abstract, but not in the concrete. And we're going to talk about that. The Apostle Paul was concerned about people, particularly the, the Romans, um, who were loving in the abstract, but not loving in the concrete, not really sincerely loving. They were faking it. They're Christians, we have them all around us, who love in the abstract. So they maintain this outward appearance of this friendly facade towards others, but really, they're just faking it. Because as soon as that person walks away, what happens? They turn to the next person, oh, I can't stand that person. 
right? There's a lot of people that they just don't like. The guy who's always asking for a favor. They see him coming and they go the other way. But if he corners them, they're, oh, hi, how are you today? Good to see you. The lady who's always gossiping or criticizing others. Those people who never seem to do their fair share of the work. Or those who simply have a very different opinion. They want to appear as though they love them because they're a Christian. But deep down, there's disdain and sometimes even real hatred. So what's the answer to this hypocritical love problem that Christians have, that we struggle with? Well, some might say, well, why be hypocritical about it? Why not, if we don't like someone, why shouldn't we just tell them? Let's not pretend. Let's just be honest about how we feel. Why not just show our dislike for that person, express our anger and irritation with them, and be open and honest? Let's not be fake. But that's not the answer either, right? We don't solve the problem of hypocritical love by expressing genuine hate. That's not the answer. We solve it by learning to love sincerely. Paul tells us that we need to love sincerely without hypocrisy. And one of the differences between Christians and the world is our ability to love, right? We should look different to the outside world because we love one another deeply, sincerely. This love comes from God. And I want to add the word solely, solely from God, right? It stems out of the fact that he first loved us. He loved us, and now, because we have accepted that love, we can learn to love like him. 1 John 4, 7 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from who? God. God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Our capacity, capacity to love um, more, is, is more than just this natural response or, or a feeling. Okay, and our capacity to love is supernatural. What does that mean? Supernatural. It doesn't come from us, it comes, right? If something's supernatural, it's not of this world, right? It comes from above. So in today's passage, Paul tells us that love must be sincere. It must be genuine, the real thing, without hypocrisy. In our natural selves, that's hard to do. It's not always easy to show genuine love and compassion to one another, but sincere love is the mark of a born-again Christian. Our love for one another should speak louder than any words that we could express. It's no matter that love is the very first fruit of the Spirit mentioned in Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit, those things that manifest in your life when you have the Holy Spirit at work in you. Right? In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is, what's the first one? Love. love. And then it lists other uh, manifestations of the Spirit in your life. This fruit that Paul mentions is the characteristic of God, these, these characteristics of God that get deposited into our life when we allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through us. And these things are given to us at salvation, and Scripture tells us that they are proof that we're Christians. It says, how will you know them? You will know them by their love. You will know them by their fruit. So we've been given this supernatural ability to love one another. Love is the anchor to every fruit of the Spirit, every other one. If you want to be patient, you got to love. If you want to have peace and joy and kindness, you got to love. In the same way, since God loved us, we should love one another and allow his love to flow through us. So as Paul finishes talking about using our spiritual gifts, being transformed by that, um, he immediately goes into talking about sincere love. He's saying, you know, use your gifts to serve one another and build the church up. And then he wastes no time in establishing what, how we should do that. And he says in verse 9, the very first part, love, let love be sincere. If you look it up in the New King James Version, it says, let love be without hypocrisy. I love that. 
The verses that follow tell us now how to have this unhypocritical love or what this sincere love looks like. So Paul makes five really powerful statements about what sincere love is. And so in our scripture passage today, we're going to look at these five statements that Paul made. The first one he says is sincere love isn't fake. It's not fake. I don't know about you, but when someone um, shares some fake love with me, I can tell, right? I can tell, and it doesn't feel good. But when someone shares sincere love with me, it feels really good. It feels from God. The first part of that verse, love must be sincere. I want to look at a couple of words. There's only four words here, and I want to look at two of them. The first one is love. There are four words for love in the Greek. We have agape, philos, right? Eros, and do you remember? Storge. Storge. Four words. The first one, I'm going to put you on the spot the whole time. Yeah, I called you a stork. (laughs) So the first one, agape love, is the one that Paul uses. And it's this high form of love, and it's used to describe God's love for mankind, God's love for people. But Paul uses it here in verse 9 to describe what our love for each other should be like. Our love for each other needs to be the same kind of love that God has for us. Whew, that's a deep love. Adam, do you love me the way you love God? (laughs) <laughs> you need to work on that <laughs> I think you love me with an agape love you love me with a godly love a love that comes from God it doesn't come from you it comes from God and Paul uses this, this word in verse 9 to describe what our love for each other should be like agape love used to describe the love that is of God and from God Verse uh, John 4, 8, I read 1 John 4, 7 already, talking about everyone who loves is born of God, God is love. And and, in verse 8, it says simply, God is love. Everyone who is born of God knows God because God is love. God doesn't merely love. He is love. Agape love is always shown by what it does. It's an action word, right? Just like faith. Faith is an action word. We we, we live our life by faithing, right? We faith it. (laughs) Not fake. We faith it. This agape word is an action word. For example, the cross most clearly shows us what God's love is like. It's an action. What did he do? He went to the cross. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 says, But because of his great love for us, Because of his love, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. His love caused this action to happen. Agape love, as modeled by Christ, isn't based on feelings. I know that you love me the way that that you should, this agape love, because it's not based on feelings, because I tease you all the time, right? You love me, And it's a supernatural love that comes from God. This agape love is a determined act or will. It's a joyful resolve. It's putting others' welfare ahead of our own. Here's something else we need to understand. Unfortunately, agape love does not come naturally to us. It's not natural. I wish that it did, but it doesn't. Because of our fallen nature, we're incapable of producing this type of love on our own. You cannot love me with agape love without being a Christian, without having the Holy Spirit. So the kind of love Paul's calling us to have should be this distinguishing mark of a Christ follower. The next word I want to talk about is sincere. The English word sincere comes from two Latin words, seen and cara, meaning without wax. Seen and cara, dishonest merchants of Jesus' day that would have these cracked pots, and they would fill these cracked pots with wax, and then they would glaze over them and sell these broken, useless pots as good quality merchandise. 
But honest merchants started labeling their pots with this word, these two words, sin cara, right? And we get sincere from that. Without wax, there's no fakeness. The word that Paul used in this verse uh, means unhypocritical. And that unhypocritical word actually, interestingly enough, comes from the acting world. You know those acting masks with the happy face and the sad face? You put that mask on to show your emotion. Paul's saying, don't put a mask on. Don't, don't be fake. Paul says that our love for one another shouldn't be fake or hypocritical, but sincere. The second thing that he says about our love is love hates evil and clings to good. The, first part of verse, uh, the second part of verse 9 says, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Now, I, I bet you never thought that in order to truly, sincerely love, you have to hate, right? In order to truly, sincerely love, you have to hate. What do you hate? Sin. That's right. You hate sin. Very good. Sincere love means that we hate what is evil. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19 describes seven things that God hates. Did you know that God hates? Yeah. Yeah. There's, it says there's, uh, in Proverbs 6, 16, the word hate there is the same word that Paul uses, and it, it talks about things that God hates. And I really like the way that Eugene P Peterson paraphrases this, so I'm going to use his paraphrase. He says, here are six things God hates, and one more that he loathes with a passion. Eyes that are haughty, a tongue that lies, hands that, are, that murder the innocent, a heart that hatches evil plots, feet that race down a wicked track, a mouth that lies under oath, a troublemaker in the family. The thing we need to note about this list of things that God hates is that they aren't people. God doesn't hate people. God hates these sins that manifest in people. Christians, too, are called to learn to hate what is evil, meaning sin, right? We detest it creeping into our hearts and ruining our relationships. We abhor its effects on those that we love. We are just uh, ultimately repelled by the eternal destruction that takes place in the lives of those that we love when they're caught up in evil acts. And this is especially true of sin that brings harm to the innocent. So this is one of the ways we need to be transformed to think like God by the renewing of our mind, um, which is what Romans 12, 2 said, hating evil. That's how we become transformed, especially the sins that intrigue us, right? Um, and this, too, doesn't come naturally. All these things are counteractive to us. So we're learning to be transformed. Unfortunately, clinging to what is good doesn't come natural to us either, right? I think by nature, a lot of us are kind of negative people, and we tend to look at the negative and focus on that, but we need to transform our minds and begin to cling to what is good. The term Paul used for good speaks of moral excellence, and the verb translated cling to means to stick or to hold together, to resist separation, to join, unite, embrace. When Paul told the Roman Christians to cling to what is good, his desire for them was that they would embrace moral goodness, that they would um, embrace it with all their being, that they would sincerely love being morally um, good. 2 Timothy 3.3 tells us that the goodness of the world, or, sorry, the godless of the world, those who don't know Christ, those who are not in Christ, hate what is good. But God's children need to be lovers of good. Mark 10, 18 tells us that God himself is good and that he is the source of all goodness. If there's anything good in your life, guess what? It comes from God. When, he, when we hold tight to God, and he begins to work his righteousness in us. And when we cling to what is good in our lives, when we love God and stick close to him, we can trust that he's transforming us. Even if we don't feel it, we can know that he is at work in us. And um, he's teaching us what his good and perfect will is. So the third thing Paul says about sincere love is it fosters a family spirit. 
Romans 12, 10, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourself. Now the word devoted, um, philostorgus, it's a family word. So talking about um, loving one another as a family. It's full of tenderness and affection and family loyalty. So we who have put our trust in Christ as our personal savior from sin, we are a family. We've been talking about that for the last couple of weeks, how we have become brothers and sisters in Christ, and God is our loving Heavenly Father. So we need to have this warm and fervent family love for one another. Family members are normally very loyal to each other, right? They're typically loyal. Um, it doesn't matter what my sister-in-law Jessica does. She's my sister-in-law, right? And um, no matter what, she's still my sister-in-law. And, and I'll rejoice with her in her accomplishments and not be jealous. I'll sympathize with her when she falters and, and not be secretly elated that she fell. I'll speak well of her to others, right? I'm not going to talk badly about her. I won't pass along stories about her that put her in a, in a bad light. I won't betray her confidence. If she lets me down, I'll tell her graciously and lovingly, but I'm also going to forgive her and let it go. I may not agree with everything she does, but when others attack her, guess what? I'm going to defend her because she's family. You can substitute Jessica for my mom or my dad or my husband or my son. We could use a little bit more of this kind of love within the church where we defend each other and build each other up and encourage one another and be there for each other when we fail. The love of the early Christians for each other left the pagan world drooling with envy. They were so jealous of the way the early church loved each other. Unbelievers today may hear that Christians are supposed to love each other, right? But often are left disappointed. People in a healthy family want to be sure that other members of the family get the respect and the honor that they deserve. They're willing to put others before themselves and, and treat them even better than they want to be treated themselves. There have been uh, probably been more church fights, I think, um, over the failure to honor people than any other reason. Why, why are there fights and, and anger in the church? Well, I didn't get mentioned from the pulpit. You mentioned Barbara and your mom and blah, 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 but I didn't get mentioned. I did something. Nobody thanked them for the job they did, right? And worse, somebody else got credit for something they did. When we truly love, these things don't matter to us anymore. Sincere love isn't fake. The fourth thing, sincere love keeps on keeping on. Romans 12, 11, and 12. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Loving other people can be hard work. You know what day of the week is most tiring for me? Friday. No, Sunday. Oh. And I only work a half a day. You know why? Because I'm loving all of you so much. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's hard work, man. You guys are hard to love. <laughs> Not all of you, just some of you, Adam. <laughs> no, it's emotional when you when you spend time with people that you love and you just pour yourself into them. It's draining. It's easy to give up and quit because loving people is tiring. Why do you think the divorce rate is so high? I'm giving up on that. That's too much work. It's too hard. But love that never quits comes from being fervent in spirit. And that means quite literally this burning fire, this boiling spirit. We have to be filled with the Holy Spirit in order for that to happen. That's going to help you to hang in there when you want to give up on someone. You just want to stop loving them because it's too difficult. 
When we allow the Holy Spirit to develop in us this true servant spirit, we'll be able to keep on loving people. We can keep on keeping on. Let's look at number five. Sincere love ministers to the needs of others. Romans 12, 13, share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Now, Paul told us earlier in Romans chapter 12 that we were called into one body and that we each belong to one another. So it only makes sense that if one of us suffers, then all of us suffers, right? Recognizing this will enable us to uh, share with one another in, and provide help to one another in a sincerely loving way. When questioned about the greatest commandment, Jesus told the disciples what? What are the greatest commandments? Love God, love God and love. love your neighbor as yourself, right? So putting one another's needs at the forefront of our minds gets the focus away from ourselves, gets it off of our problems, and it's way easier to notice the needs of those around us when we're not so immersed in our own needs, right? So let's, I want to share just two, two commands that Paul gives in this verse, and then we're going to wrap it up. The two commands in this verse describe practical ways that we can do that. First, Paul writes that we must contribute to the needs of others, to other believers. Now, the practice of this in the early church made them stand out like nothing else. The wealthier members of the church would sell off land and animals and they would contribute it to the church so that everybody's needs in the church were being met. Right? In the same way, we're commanded to show hospitality to each other. I think about Paul and how he journeyed back in, in his day and how risky it was to be a traveler like that. But Christians, they welcomed Paul and others who were planting churches and ministering to people. Um, they ministered to them. Why? How? By inviting them into their home. They would open their home to them, and it would give them a safe place so that they were safe from thieves and weather and violence. We need to open ourselves up to other believers. Welcome them in. Show hospitality. We're called to provide that same service to one another. So sincere love isn't sitting around trying to drum up these feelings of affection, trying to make ourselves like somebody, right? It's, it's reaching out unselfishly to minister to people, acting, doing, acting in loving ways. Not to show them how wonderful of a person we are, or as C.S. Lewis put it, sitting down and then just waiting for them to show their gratitude, no, sincere love is simply forgetting about ourselves and caring about the needs of other people. Any comments, questions, or concerns? Jackie. Um, I just want to say I'm a server, so I'm in the public eye all the time. Yep. And, um, my prayer every day before I go in to work is that the Holy Spirit lives and breathes inside of me and nice. comes and shows the people I'm waiting on, you know, I want them to see his love through me. That's right. That's my prayer every day before I go to yep. work. So Jackie has the gift of service, spiritual gift of service. She happens to be a server in her natural life, but she uses that gift in her everyday life. And I love that. You're using your gift that the Holy Spirit has given you, and you're practicing sincere love in the world. I love I that. I want everyone to see it through me. Linda. And we do see it. We do see it. Your love is sincere. I know my dad passed on Wednesday. Oh. And so my family needs prayer. We will. How's your mom doing? Not good. Okay. I'll call her. Thank you for telling me. Your dad was pretty awesome. He was a pretty great guy. Anyone else? You guys are quiet today. Oh, up here, John. What I don't like. Oh. Uh, so I'm not a super big fan of the fake it till you make it mm -hmm. thing, but the reality is it's kind of true. Mm -hmm. Like there are many, 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 many times that I had to fake it until it became true, mm -hmm. until I actually did love that person. Maybe I loved them the whole time. Okay, well, obviously God's love, you know, whatever, but I didn't feel it. I didn't feel it. 
but I just had to, you know, keep doing what you said to do mm -hmm. until it happened. Yeah, I, I think that we say fake it till you make it, but I don't think it's fake when you're being obedient. You're faithing it till you make it. Okay, yes, all right. Yeah. So I, can, I can, okay, I can take that away. Yeah. Faith it. Till you make, make it. it, yep. Okay, yeah. You need to get it on, get it on, Greg. <laughs> Faith it till you make it. Anyone else? Oh, Victoria. The one thing that I say in my work, because I work with some difficult people mm. in difficult circumstances, is to bless them and change me. Yeah. When I'm working with somebody that I'm having a hard time loving or having compassion. That's for. right. Yeah, the best advice I think I was ever given in how to deal with people that just rubbed me the wrong way I didn't, I didn't love was, uh, you know, not to pray that God would change them but pray that God would help me to see them through his eyes yeah. and that he would change me the way I felt about them. And when you do that, you start to love them the way that God loves them, right? Tommy? Yeah. Um, I got this thing between loving a person and liking them. Yeah, now, they're different. They're very different. Big difference. I love my brother. Because I love you, Tommy. I know. Oh. I know. Hey. <laughs> what's not to love? I'm telling you, I like you too. I do. I can't help it. I've tried not to. <laughs> um, I love my brother. Yeah. But I don't like him. Yeah. I don't like some of the things he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the difference between loving a person and liking him mm -hmm. is what? A world of difference. That's a whole nother sermon. I mean, well, how do we balance that? Well, I think you're doing well. If you love your brother, but you don't like the things that he's doing, you don't like him necessarily. I think I think you're already doing that. Um, you just can you you faith it. You keep loving. You you ask God for this supernatural love that comes only from Him. And when you do that, He is He is faithful. He says, ask. And I'll give it to you. So we have to ask him for that love. Sean has something to add to that, I think. First Corinthians says, now by the faith, hope, and charity, when we love somebody, we're acting out of faith. When we like somebody, we're acting out of emotions. So, you know, go with your go with what is was godly, the love, the faith, the charity, you know, the faith, hope, and charity. And and you don't have to worry so much about your emotions. You just do what God is telling you to do by faith, give that love, and, uh, and you know, I, I don't think you have to worry so much yep. about the emotional part of it. You just stand, stand obedient in the loving part of it. I will say this, that every time there's been a person who I don't like, I, uh, let me tell you a story about this girl. This girl came to the church, she came to a family camp, that we had, her sister invited her. There was no family camp that year for the division. So we had a family camp of her own. Her sister brought this, this girl. I did not like this girl. I, I just could not wait for that family camp to be over. I had to get out of there. I couldn't stay. And that doesn't happen to me very often. But this girl I did not like. And next thing I know, the next week at church, this girl shows up at church. And I'm, Lord, you got to help me. Well, it just so happened that there was a women's retreat coming up like the next weekend. And this girl wanted to go to the women's retreat. And she ends up going to the women's retreat and sharing like an adjoining room with me. Ends up in my room. I'm like going crazy because I don't like this girl. But I just prayed, God, you have to help me love this girl because I don't like her. Before that weekend was out, Kendra... Became your friend? No. She ended up moving in with me the next day. See, the thing is, I didn't know that Kendra was battling addiction until that weekend. I didn't know that she was struggling. I didn't know that God was doing something in her life and she was fighting it. But before that weekend was out, I loved her so much. And before the month was out, a month of living with her, I actually liked her. And now she's on my top 10 list of favorite people. And she's my adopted daughter. And I, you know, helped her in her recovery. I married her and her husband. Her, granddaughter, or her daughter is my granddaughter. And 
my daughter and my son fight like siblings. I have to pull them apart all the time. When you, when you ask God to help you love, you do end up liking that person, right? Because you start to see them the way that God sees them. And I'm telling you, there, there's something likable in everyone. You may be hard to find. You might have to, like, you know, sift through. But there is good. And that's why we have to cling to the good. You find the good in that person. And you cling to that. You, you focus on that. You hate what's evil. And you cling to that good. I, I only hated you for a little bit, but now I really like you. She does not like it when I tell that story. I told it at camp one time in a devotional, and she was sitting right next to me, and this whole time nobody in the room knew it was her. And then all of a sudden I said, and now she's my adopted daughter, and everyone was like, whoa! <laughs> and she, yeah. But I did ask for permission. And that was like five years ago, six years ago. And so I've told it like 20 times since then. I only asked for permission once. But I figure she signed her, her name on that. I'm using it whenever I want, right? It's a blank permission, it's a blank permission slip. It's better in a setting like this. Like that, they all cry. Oh, yeah, they were bawling. <laughs> all right. Yeah, look at She's a totally different person, right? Yep. And I think all those likable things were there. They were just buried by all the evil that had festered and scabbed over the good. And so now we can see that. And she's a very likable. Everybody here likes Kendra, right? She's our social service director because everybody in this town likes Kendra. So, all right. Well, we're already quarter after, so I'm going to say to you, may the peace of the Lord be with you. Thank you. Love one another. Be good. Be good. And go get your kids. Go get your kids. That's right.